give God some praise. Amen. I remember in 19, December of 1990, amen, going into, uh, it was the new year going into 1991. I was in Philadelphia at a Christian conference, and, and my friend, he, went to, he, was, he was from Philly, and his church, uh, Mount Airy Church of God in Christ, was having a New Year's Eve service with, with some of the great singers in the, in the Church of God in Christ, and Myrna Summers was there, and then there was this, uh, this bishop there, this reverend there, Reverend Timothy Wright, amen, and he sang that song, amen, that night, in anticipation of that album coming out later that year, amen, Trouble Don't Last Always. I came because I wanted him to sing my song, Who's on the Lord's Side? Amen. But then when he's saying trouble don't last always, I'm telling you, that messed us up because he quotes in that song, uh, Psalms 30, verse 5, where it says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I'm telling you right now, that's, I don't know about you, that, that's, I got, I got a lot of scriptures and I like, you know, like Romans 8, 28 and other, but that one right there, weeping may endure for a night, but joy come in the morning because you're going to have some trouble, you're going to have some challenges, you're going to deal with some bereavement, you're going to deal with some pain. You're going to deal with some hurt. But I got good news for you. You're not going to cry all the time. I'm trying to help somebody that you're not going to cry all the time. You might be crying now. You might be weeping now. But God, I, I serve a God that can wipe every tear from your eye and bring joy to your soul and joy to your spirit. Trouble don't last always. Amen. To God be the glory. Once again, we're going to be uh, picking up in our, our, our scripture lesson in Revelations chapter 2. It says, verse 4 of chapter 2, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider or remember how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you first did. May God bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. I want to minister from the subject today, get the love back. Get the love back. I need you to uh, fake high five a couple of folks. Just pretend you're high five them and say, neighbor, get the love back. Get the love back. Amen. Get the love back. Praise God. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for uh, the prayers and the praises, the songs and the, that have brought us to this moment that have tilled the grounds of our souls so that the word of God can be deposited. We ask right now in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit will speak and speak ever so clearly to us. Even though this was a word spoken to the churches 2,000 plus years ago, it is still a word that resonates to the church right now. Speak Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name and all the people of God said amen. And Lord, we know all on top of that, Lord, give us an anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Speak now, Lord. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, and all the people of God said, amen. Amen. I'm going to be teaching a seven-part series called Being a Better Church. Amen. Everybody say, Being a Better Church. And today's lesson on being a better church is we want to get the love back and make sure uh, we didn't forsake the, our first love. And so uh, under this series, Being a Better Church, this is the first sermon entitled, Get the Love back. Well, you know, it's a terrible thing to think you have it all together, but in reality are missing the most crucial element. It's, a, it's hard to admit that you forgot the most important ingredient. Uh, what if you were making a cake and forgot the sugar? What if you were making a pizza and forgot the sauce? What if you were frying chicken and God forbid you forgot the seasoning? A cake can look like a cake, but if it doesn't have sugar, you're just putting frosting on bread. A pizza can look like a pizza, but if it has no sauce uh, under the cheese, all you're doing is eating big cheese sticks. Uh, chicken can look appetizing, but if it doesn't have any seasoning, uh, nobody will ask that chicken to be made again, and you probably will be stuck to bring in plates and utensils to the next cookout. The, my point is, is that some things can't be left out. Some things can't be omitted. Some things are just necessary for all the other things to come together. Can I get an amen? Uh, and that doesn't just apply to baking cakes and frying chickens. Uh, 
I was watching a video last night of some guys building a, a great big uh, yard, a great big landscape wall in a, in, a, in, a, in a backyard. It was a big thing. And, they, and at one point, they were building this huge retaining wall. The wall looked complete, uh, Brother Farrar. It looked really nice, uh, uh, Deacon Kevin. I would want a wall like that in my own backyard. It was positioned perfect. It was angled just right. The bricks and the blocks were beautiful. But when one of the workers leaned on the wall, it all came falling down. They forgot to put uh, some cement between the blocks. Uh, the blocks were too tall not to put some cement there between them. The main thing that was necessary for the wall to remain standing was missing. Uh, now, that's not to say that the other things weren't important, but what it is to say is that some things are just essential, Sister Miller. For example, you can be in a relationship for years. You can have the nice house, the nice car, the beautiful smart kids, and by all accounts, uh, all things visible and all indications, everything is going well. But if we're able to take a closer examination, the passion may have fizzled out. The excitement has dissipated. The romance is on hold, and the fire ain't so bright in the relationship. Uh, if you're in that situation, you ought to get the love back. Uh, uh, some relations have happened that have gone like that. They speak more to strangers than they speak to their spouse. Uh, they spend more time holding their phones than they hold their spouse's hands. Uh, they get more likes online than they do in the bedroom. Uh, they, they, they got to get the love back. Um, they get more excited about their favorite team than about the new dress their wife is wearing. Uh, you care more about your nice furniture and how it looks when company comes over than your spouse's feelings that's there all the time. Uh, the fire is gone. The passion has fizzled. The love is stale. You got to get the love back. The love, uh, you can have everything, but if you don't have the love, you're missing something. Even the Apostle Paul said you can sing like angels, preach like great preachers and prophets, but you have no love, you missed it all, amen. There's sometimes there's some crucial elements that are necessary, and when we talk about relationships, amen, you got to have love there. One of the things I tell couples in counseling is to remember uh, what it was like when you first fell in love. Uh, remember when you first started dating. Uh, I'm trying to help somebody here. Recall how you how much you wanted to talk to them all the time. Uh, recall how you couldn't wait to be in their presence. Uh, the love was fresh. Uh, remember how you would make sure you were smelling good and looking good before you saw them? Remember how you were trying to impress them all the time? Remember uh, how you were anxious to please them? I'm trying to help somebody here. Remember how you couldn't wait for their call? You called them in the morning. You called them in the afternoon. You called them on their way to work. You called them in the car. You called them when they got out of the car. Hey, Amen. You couldn't wait to talk to them. You can remember how your heart felt how you smile when they came into the room how the love was fresh uh, you 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 look you, you just don't want to look you just don't want to you know you you learn to be around them all the time nothing else seemed to matter when they were around amen some of y'all remember what i'm talking about anybody remember love like that amen uh, you were consumed with all things them look, I, ain't, I ain't getting enough claps lord have mercy i need to pray for y'all Amen. Somebody would just mention that name and, and you would get to smile and somebody, something would remind you of them and you get all giddy inside. You just wanted to breathe the air that they breathe. Amen. Can I testify for a second? Oh my God. When I first met a first lady, amen, I had a 3.6 GPA at Howard, but when we started dating, my grades fell like rain in April. Amen. I could barely study. I could barely think of anything outside of Cassandra Elder. Oh my God. If we didn't get married, I would have lost my mind. Amen. Cassandra Elder could do no wrong in my book. She walked on water, floated in the air. I tell her all the time, I can remember the first girl, I can remember the first day I ever saw you. You walked into the forum at the Blackburn Center at Howard University. Amen. It was in September of 1988. I tell her, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. I can tell you what your hair looked like, what she had on, the glasses she wore, the clothes she wear. I went back to my dorm and called my buddy at the University of Maryland and told him I had seen and met the the prettiest girl to ever walk this side of glory. Amen. That was 32 years ago. We've been married 29 of those years. And every now and then, I got to look at some old pictures and reflect and remind myself to maintain the love we had at first. And beloved, it's a terrible thing to in, in any relationship to forget how things were and let things get stale and cold. Somebody say we got to get the love back. And every now and then you must rekindle the fire, awaken those passions, and fall in love again. Go back on dates. I'm trying to help somebody. Spend some quality time and, and, and do things that you did at first. I, I am going to talk about the church, but let me help some folk in 
relationships. Uh, every now and then you got to go back to what you used to do. You used to buy them dinner. Amen. You used to, amen, get her flowers. You used to compliment her. You got to go back to doing the things you did at first. Uh, the reason they fell in love with you, the reason you fell in love with them, you got to go back and do the things that you did at first because some of us under the sound of my voice, amen, your marriage has gotten stale, your relationship has gotten cold. But if you go back, Okay, I ain't get no amens in here. Lord have mercy. We got to pray. We got to pray. Amen. My hours are two to five. Amen. On Wednesdays and Thursdays. Come on in. Let me help you. Remind you what it was like. Amen. The love. Get that love back. Y'all looking here like, Pastor, I'm trying to remember what it was. Amen. But just like our natural relationships can become stale and routine and how we have to get our natural relationships back on track. So too, our spiritual relationship with the Lord can get dry and stale and we must get it back on track. And it's not because God has done anything different. Let me help you, somebody. Amen. If our relationship with God has grown stale, it's not that God hasn't been waking us up in the morning, starting us on our way. And then that God didn't make the sun to kiss you on your forehead in the morning and the gentle breeze to get you through the day. It ain't like God been providing for you and protecting you and, and keeping you and watching you and loving you and blessing you and giving you favor and giving you grace. God been blessing you going in and blessing you going out. God been blessing you in the city and blessing you in the country. God been blessing all that you put your hand to. It ain't that God hadn't done everything he's supposed to do. Amen. You change. Oh, help me somebody. Amen. God has been the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. There is no wavering with our Lord. He has been good. He is good. It will always be good, but we've changed. Oh, sometimes we need to take a look at our relationship with God and make sure that our love has not grown cold and stale. Every now and then we got to make sure we got the love and get the love back. Well, that's where we find this church in Ephesus in this text. Uh, uh, and it is appropriate that these seven letters start with the church in Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus was in the largest city of the Roman province of Asia. And by the time the gospel had been preached there, the population was nearly a quarter of a million people in this city. And it was located at the mouth of a great river and a, and a great sea in such a way that many people would start their journey off into Asia coming through Ephesus. Ephesus was the beginning of that great road towards from the Euphrates as well as other roads uh, throughout the valleys. Um, it was a breathtaking city. It was a beautiful city. Uh, the traveler from Rome, when they land in the, in the city of Ephesus, would, would be faced with a huge street that was, was filled with marketplaces, stores, and malls. This was a beautiful city. But not only was it a beautiful city, it was a very religious city. They had temples to the Roman gods and temples to the Roman emperors and all sorts of temples. There, there were even bigger than temples you would see in cities like Greece. Uh, this was a huge place, a beautiful place, amen. Uh, it was, and here, this is a, the church. This church was a popular church and, and a big church in this city. Well, this letter is addressed, amen, to the angel or the messenger of this church. Uh, oftentimes we think the stars or the angels or messengers of these churches were the pastors of these churches or the bishops of these churches in this day. For Ephesus in this day will be considered a mega church. It was a big church, a powerful church, amen. And this letter is written to this church. Uh, and if any church, amen, uh, needs to hear from the Lord, it's a church like this. This is a big church. Uh, they've been, they've been, they're big, and so Jesus... Jesus writes this letter and he tells John, amen, to deliver this letter to the church. Uh, it says, he says, uh, and it says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, I write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Jesus first in this letter initiates who he is. Now, the first thing he lets you know is he's the one that holds a star in its and in his hand, amen. He's the one that empowers the leadership at this church. He's the source and strength of everything that's going on in this church. Hey, beloved, and hey, we as Second Baptists have to be reminded that our source and our strength doesn't come because of who we are, but because of who we belong to. You know, here when I'm talking about, we should never think that it's our power, our strength, or our money, but it's always God's power, God's strength, and God's resource. He lets them know, I'm, I'm the one that's holding everything together. I'm the one that's maintaining everything. I am the source and 
strength of everything. And then I walk among the lampstand. What are you saying? I, I see all and know all. I'm the one that knows the ins and outs. I'm the one that knew you from the beginning and will know you at the end. Uh, he's, the, he's the all-knowing God. He, he knows, so there's two things he wants them to see. He has all the power of the church, uh, and he knows everything that's going in the church. So who better to give a, a critique on the church or, or even a, yeah, a com commendation on the church than the one that is holding the church together and knows everything about the church. So he says, I am the one. Uh, and so here, he's here to, to give them, amen, a critique and a commendation. He walks in the midst and he, he, he's recognized as, as the head of the church. Uh, in verse 1, he established himself as the one who oversees and controls the church. Uh, the church is victorious and powerful by Christ's power and not man's efforts. Let me say it again. The church is victorious and powerful because of Christ uh, and not our efforts. Uh, and so what we see is that the church, uh, though they had been a strong church uh, uh, and a powerful church, amen, they still needed some help, amen. They were strong in their teaching. They were strong in their works, uh, but they still needed some help. And beloved, we should never think that we don't need to get better. We should never think that we have it all together. Let me help you again. We should never think that our stuff could need some improving. Oh, I'm trying to help you, church. Amen. At, even at Second Baptist, uh, we've got to constantly say, oh, what could we do better? How could we do it better? How could we show the love of God more? How can we demonstrate God's goodness better? Uh, even at, at, we sometimes have to go back to the drawing board and say, oh, we need to do this better. This needs to be stronger. We need to line ourselves up. We've got to get better in some things uh, because the church ought to be all about being better every day. And we have to understand that every now and then God is going to speak highly of our work, but also give us some critiques on how we can get better. And so here, this church, this church in Ephesus, uh, they knew the scriptures, but maybe they failed to love God like they needed to do. They had great ministry, but maybe it wasn't what it was supposed to do. But but so Jesus gives them a commendation. He gives them some good things they're doing, but also he said, I want to give you some critiques. Uh, well, let's take a look at the good things they were doing. Uh, in verse 2 and 3, the Lord says, uh, you, you, you got great sacrificial service. Amen. You, you, you don't like evil. You have spiritual discernment. You are you are steadfast in what you do, and you hate what the Nicolaitans do. That's a little later on. He says, uh, "He says, I know your deeds. Uh, y'all, y'all, y'all serve good. Amen. I know your hard work you, you, and your perseverance. You, you've been faithful. Amen. You, you've been doing it right. I, and I know you hate evil, and, and you have, so you have spiritual discernment. You have been able to determine what is true and what is false. Uh, he's giving them all sorts of, 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 of kudos. Uh, y'all doing this right, uh, and." You, you, you got this down right. Uh, this, is, this is a good church by all accounts. Amen. Uh, by all accounts, uh, this church in Ephesus is a good church. I don't know about you, but I would love to hear the Lord say, I, I like your deeds. I would love to hear the Lord say, amen, uh, you hate evil. I, I would love to hear the Lord say, uh, you work hard and you persevere. I, I, I'm telling you, when all is said and done, I want to hear those things, amen, from the Lord. But even though he can give them those good accolades, and they didn't become weary. They worked hard. They, were, they, they didn't even get weary in well-doing. He says there's still some things uh, that you need to do. Uh, by all accounts, this is a good church. Uh, but how many y'all know things can look good from the outside, but be tore up on the inside. Amen. Uh, the choir might sound good on Sunday, but they were fighting uh, during the week. Uh, the ushers may stand in position on Sunday, but they may have had an argument at the meeting on Thursday. Uh, the deacons might have prayed, amen, but he was arguing with his wife. Uh, the deaconess might have been doing it all right, uh, but you should have heard the gossip that she was all about. The trustees might have been here early in the morning, but they were early in the morning to complain about something over and over again. Ah! Uh, uh, Oh, beloved, things can look good on the outside. Oh, I ain't getting no amens today. Oh, man. And I guess a long message, too. Oh, my goodness. Pray for me. Amen. And, beloved, this is the thing that we got to watch here at Second Baptist. The city might recommend us. Or the city may recognize us. Or the paper can commend us. They may highlight us on a TV program. We might do some really good work. Or, but we can easily be like this church in Ephesus that looks good from the outside but is tore up on the inside. Uh, oh, this... 
this letter should cause us some concern. Uh, this, letter, this letter should really have us evaluating our relationship with God as a whole and individually because we too easily can become like Ephesus. Oh, this is a good this is a good word for a church like Second Baptist. We could we could read this letter and think about we shouldn't read this letter, excuse me, and think about the church down the street. Uh, we should read this letter and think about us. Jesus commends them. The work they were doing was commendable, but they had forgotten their first love. My God, my God, uh, uh, they, 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 they had, they had, they had uh, in their mind, they, they, they had done good deeds, but they forgotten the crucial element that was their first love. Jesus lets them know that they got to get the love back. Somebody say, get the love back. Uh, they, they had deeds, but no love. They had work, but not real worship. They had programs, but not real power. They had Bible study, but no real group, growth. They had ministries, but, but no smiles and no joy. But love, we must hear these words from the Lord and think about us. We got to commit to being a better church. Second battle, let me say it again. We got to commit to being a better church. It, it's not about being the biggest church. It's not about being the most popular church, but we do need to be a better church. Oh, I'm trying to help you. I think we do a whole lot of good stuff, but we still need to be a better church. I, I like what Second Baptist does, but we still need to be a better church. I, I think we do some really good things. I, I think we've knocked out. We really are about some good stuff, but we can be a better church. Amen. It's nothing wrong than trying to be better. Amen. That's a sign of humility when you realize you can do a whole lot better. Uh, we need to be a better church. Uh, we need to commit to being a better church. Amen. We need to commit to make sure that our love for the Lord does not grow cold and stale and that our love for one another does not grow cold and stale. For when you love each other, you love God. Yes. Amen. So Jesus, Jesus commends them about their good works, but then he offers them a criticism. And, and we can't be so arrogant to think that we're not above a good godly critique. Jesus commends them, but he also gives them some other criticism that is designed not to break them. Hallelujah but to build them back and make them better. That's the good thing. Hallelujah. I can shout right there. That when the Lord comes to correct you, it ain't to break you. When the Lord comes to correct you, it's not to mesh tear you up. When the Lord comes to correct you, it's there to build you up. That's how any good criticism should be. Uh, it's there to build you up. Jesus didn't come to tear you down, but he came to take away the stuff in you and around you that ain't going to be beneficial to you so that you can be better in Christ. Uh, he offers this critique. Uh, it might hurt. It might be sharp. It might prick. But it was designed to make you stronger. And beloved, you and I can't be folk that can't receive some critique. Amen. So that we could be better in the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, Jesus commends them and he gives us a criticism that's designed not to break them, but to build them up and make them better. And we do it. We would do well to receive criticism to be better believers and a better church. Jesus tells them they have, he says, that, but you've forsaken your first love. Uh, some of us in all of our efforts and all of our deeds, uh, somehow they, they forgot Jesus. They forgot to honor Christ. They had omitted Jesus. They had forgot the Lord. The first love in this text means their zeal and passion for Christ had dissipated. Uh, when they first came to Christ, they understood the grace that was given to them. When they first came to Christ, they understood how God, what God had to do to take them out of darkness and bring them into the marvelous light. When they first came to Christ, they, they understood what God had to do to adopt them into the family of faith. They, they understood the favor of God. They were keenly aware of the gift that was their salvation. They were excited. They were passionate about all things Jesus. They were overjoyed with the Lord. Uh, let me say it again. They were overjoyed with the Lord. Their passion and zeal was at a high level. They understood the mercy and favor of God. I'm trying to help somebody. They understood the gift that was their salvation. Let me say it again. They understood the mercy and grace, amen, because when you just get saved, you had a front row seat of where you were and now where God is about to take you. And some of us been saved so long, we forgot the dirt that we was in. We forgot the trouble that we were in. We forgot the mess that we were in. We forgot the grip that alcohol had on us. We forgot the grip that Heron had on us. 
us. Uh, we forgot that we were real close to that crack pipe. We forgot that we were real mean, real ugly, real nasty, but God delivered us uh, and set us free. Uh, and you can't never forget what God did for you and remember how it was when you realized there was no more shame and no more guilt, no more condemnation for you that was in Christ Jesus and how good you felt when the burden was lifted, the shame was taken away and you were free in Christ uh, and you were now victorious. Uh, you didn't have that taste in your mouth. You didn't have that desire to do go back to them and God had set you free. You know what you let me tell you, you got you can't never forget. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can't never forget. Ah, uh, but beloved, it's so easy to forsake the Lord. It's so easy, amen, to sing and forget what you're singing about. It's so easy to usher and forget God ushers you into the kingdom of God. It's so easy to serve and forget why you're serving. It's so easy to forget the joy and the privilege it is of being in Christ. Do you understand what he had to do to save your soul? Do you understand what God had to do to deliver you and take the guilt of sin off of your life for eternity so now that your soul is rested in heavenly places and when all is said and done, you'll be with the Lord in his kingdom forever and ever. Do you understand what God had to do? He had to sift through trillions upon trillions of stars. Uh, come down here, pick you and I up out of the muck and mire, put our feet on a solid rock and save our soul. He had to move heaven and earth to do something for you. He had to move death, hell, and the grave out of the way to save your soul and to save my soul. And beloved, we can't ever forget that. That's got to be on our mind when we wake up in the morning. Morning, that's got to be on our mind in the middle of the day and that's got to be on our mind when we go to bed that's got to be on our mind when we're singing the songs of Zion that's got to be on our mind when we're playing the drums that's got to be on our mind when we're playing the bass that's got to be on our mind when we're standing at the door that's got to be on our mind when we're praying that's got to be on our mind when we're going to the grocery store God's giving me food to eat that's got to be on our mind we woke up this morning God's giving the blood to run warm in my body that's got to be on our mind when we lay down in bed God's giving me a place uh, to put down my sleepy head I'm here to let you know you can never forget yeah, yeah. Yeah. ah the first thing Jesus says in verse 5 he says he says consider how far you have fallen Jesus says consider in some translations was, is remember and I want to use that word remember what it was like when you first came to Christ Remember the passion you had. Remember how you prayed and remember how you wanted to know more and more and, and you couldn't put your Bible down. Remember how every chance you got, you went to the Lord and then you got excited when you saw God answer prayer. Remember how you couldn't wait to tell your testimony what God had did for you. Amen. You remember when you first got saved, you testified about everything. You know, you know, God gave me a parking space. Amen. I was last in line at the grocery store and then God made a way for me to get up in the front of the grocery store. Amen. You know, I couldn't believe it. I was praying and boom, that thing shot. When you, when you first came to the Lord, you testified about everything. Amen. You testified about the light turning red just at the right moment. You testified, amen, about finding a pair of shoes on sale. You couldn't wait to tell your testimony. You got up in church, amen, folks talking about cancer. You said, but I'm going to let you know I got a parking space at the mall. You didn't mind testifying about everything because you saw God in everything. Yeah. Folk got tired of your testimony. She's going to testify again. Yes, she is. Remember how you'd be the one you wanted to go to Sunday school and how you wanted to get in the church, amen. You'd be at the door, you would beat the janitor here, amen. You, you, when someone said, can we have volunteers, you was first to run in line, amen. They said, we need to make a donation. You had your checkbook out. Remember, they said, can you worship lead? All you could do all night long, you was excited about the fact that you were going to worship lead that next morning. Remember when your family members got saved, you were shouting and overcome with joy because you realized that God was blessing, amen. Jesus says, remember. And every now and then, we must go back to the cross. We must go back to the time when we didn't know the Lord and remember how far God has brought us. Every now and then, we must remember that the Lord delivered us, what he delivered us from. And every now and then, we need to remember the tight grip that sin had on our lives. Amen. Uh, we must remember how excited we were when we first were saved. How excited we were to know we were going to heaven, how the chains were broken, how Satan don't have his grip on us anymore, the excitement and the joy and the peace. Where did the joy go? He says, remember. And we remember we need to, and when we remember, we need to lift up our hands and shout. 
We remember we might have to dance. We remember, hold on, well, God, oh my goodness. Whoa, I got some of us got to go back 30 years, but go back 30 years in your mind and, and look at where you are, where you were, and look at where you are now. And say, hold on now. Look at where you were living and how God brought you. Look at how you were living and how, how God brought you every now and then. See, some of us got so comfortable with our blessing, we forgot we weren't always blessed like this. Amen. We forgot it wasn't always like this. Amen. There were some lonely nights and some weary days, and God has blessed you, and God has opened some doors, but you can't never forget. Uh, remember what it was like, amen. He remember, and not only just Jesus says, remember how far they have fallen, but he also tells the church, repent. Uh, re remember means, uh, excuse me, repent means to turn from the direction you're currently headed and make a 180 degree turn and go in the opposite direction. Remember, repent, excuse me, means to, to stop and turn. Repent means to acknowledge what you're going, that you're going in the wrong direction. It's hard to do, but it's a must. And, and sometimes the church has to stop and recalibrate. Sometimes the church has to stop and recenter. Sometimes the church has to stop and examine things, amen. Uh, 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 we have to, amen, uh, we got to be careful about this thing. We've got to be careful about this. Uh, he says repent. Yes, you have good deeds, but repent. Yes, you have strong doctrine, but repent. Yes, you hate what God hates, but repent. This was a good church, but they still needed to repent. Oh, I'm trying to help us right now. It was a good church. He says, I know your deeds. I know what you do. I like it. But I got this one issue. Remember how far you've fallen. You've lost, you've forsaken your first love. You've forsaken your first love. Remember what it was like. Go back to what it was like when you were so joyous about your relationship with God. You, you've lost your first love. Where's the joy? Where's the love? Where's the happiness? Where, where's the excitement? Where is the zeal? This was a good church, but he tells a good church to repent. And if he would, and listen here, beloved, if he tells a good church to repent, whoo, they were a powerful church, but they needed to repent. And it's hard for good churches to see they need to repent. But oftentimes, that's exactly what we need to do. Stop, turn, and go in a different direction. Jesus says, repent and do the things you did at first. And you know, that means that there's some way down the road they had forgotten the things that got them where they were. They forgotten their relationship with God. I don't know. Maybe Bible study had dwindled off a little bit. Maybe prayer meeting didn't have as many people in it. Maybe uh, when they call uh, the donations were a little bit lower. Maybe uh, nobody wanted to really serve with a smile. Maybe the songs weren't being sung with the excitement. Uh, maybe the ushers didn't have the same level of smiles on it. Maybe they weren't excited to go out into the community. Maybe I don't know what it was. Amen. But Jesus says you need to go back to doing the things you did at first. Amen. And Beloved, that's what we have to do. He says this. He says, not only should you remember and repent, but he says, return. Go back to do the thing that you did at first. Uh, this is the part, beloved, that convicted me as I was writing it. This is the part that, 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 that hit me hard. When I was preparing this lesson, I, I, I had to admit there are a whole lot of things that I don't do like I used to do or even do at all in my personal relationship with the Lord. I'm just speaking about myself, amen. I felt convicted. I felt embarrassed. Uh, but the good news is we still have time to get it right. Y'all not hearing what I'm talking about. Uh, he didn't wait till I, I, I got totally, he said, Ralph, there's some, there's some stuff you need to put back in. There's some stuff you need to get back to doing. There's some stuff that you used to be about. Yeah, you might you might get this right, you might get that right, but there's some other stuff, amen, that you used to do that was really foundational to what you're doing in Christ uh, that was really extremely important that you had to do. And so I had to read this lesson and preach it to myself, amen, and get myself off the floor and wipe my tears and get myself together and admit I got to do some stuff. I know y'all got it all together. I know you dot every I and cross every T, but your pastor amen, had to look at this text and, and look at this scripture and say, mm, maybe I'm just like Ephesus. Uh, maybe I need to make sure I go back to my first love and, and have my zeal uh, and have my excitement and have my joy and get back into loving and reading the word and, and get back into praying in the morning and noon and night and get back to telling the story, telling my, my, my faith and sharing the good news and, and letting everybody know there's a God that can save you, a God that can turn you around, a 
God that can give you new life, a, a God that can give you abundant life, a God that loves you. Maybe I need to go back to some of the simpler things I was doing. I used to say, Lord, put me in line with someone every day that I can tell them about Jesus Christ. Uh, I haven't prayed that prayer in a long time, uh, but now today, you know what? Uh, October the 2nd or whatever day it is, I'm praying that prayer. Lord, put me in line where I can tell somebody what God can do for them. Put me in a position where I can tell my testimony. Put me in a position where I can tell somebody God's got a plan for your life. God loves you more than you'll ever know. God wants to heal you, deliver you, set you free, and then get you walking in the purpose that God designed for your life. I used to pray that prayer every day. Uh, and now I, I realize I, I haven't prayed that prayer in a minute, but starting today, I'm going back to doing it. I used to wake up in the morning, read my word. Now I get to it when I get to it. But the Lord said, you need to get up first thing in the morning, the same way you want bacon and eggs. Uh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The same way you want to get, amen, uh, uh, iced tea in the afternoon. You need to drink from the fountain where nobody ever goes thirsty. In the same way that you want to go to Applebee's or, or Outback and get those wings you like. The same way you would see taste of the word of God is sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Ah, I got to go back. Ah, I got good news. Good. I got good news, beloved. We can commit today to going back to our first love. And some of that means we got to remember and then return, amen, to all that God had us, had us in the beginning the same way. He says, if you don't, I'm going to take the lampstand away. Ooh. But then he says, I like he said, but those who have ears, let them hear. So we got two choices. You can ignore it and lose. Or you can receive it and win. Amen. I'm going to win. I don't know about you, but I got ears to hear and a heart to want to do this thing. Amen. And I hope Second Baptist is with me. And look, that we got to get our love back. Amen. Individually and collectively. Because we don't want to be about ministry, but not really be about love. We don't want to be about programs and not have any power. That requires us to really go back and, and discover our first love in Christ. Stand to your feet. That's the end of my sermon. Amen. Choir, if you're ready to come. When I first got saved, every chance I got, I would tell somebody that, you know, I was in church, but I didn't really know God. And you don't want to be in church and not have a real relationship with God. I knew to come I need to go to this and go to that, but I didn't have a real relationship with God. But then when I got that real relationship with God, I let the Spirit of God come in. Wow, it changed my life. It was December of 1987. And, beloved, I've never been the same since. And I'm telling you if, you, if you don't know Christ, this is your opportunity to come now. You can give your life to Christ, and I tell you, I promise you, your life will never be the same. Commit to the Lord. Become a disciple of Christ. Your life will never be the same. God has a plan for your life. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior and Lord, but are ready to get to know the Lord, I want you to come right now. I need my ministers to go to the phones. Amen. To, thank you. Amen. Praise God. If you're watching and you know you need Christ, I want you to give you, to make a call, 804-232. 5124. Our ministers are at the phone to call. If you don't hear, if you don't uh, get a voice, leave a message. Amen. But I think you hit uh, response number four for the call to go right through. But if you're under the sound of my voice in this building, and you've never given your life to Christ, I'm here to let you know God has a plan for your life better than you could ever experience to save you to heal you, deliver you, to give you an abundant life here, but also to take care of you on the other side and give you a place in heaven. You don't want to miss out on that. You don't miss out what God has for you now, but you don't want to have a miss out on what God has for you on the other side. For the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that's anybody, believe in him, would, have ever, would, would not perish, would not have to experience the wrath of God or the punishment of God, 
but would have everlasting life. That's what God has for you. If you, if you want to get saved, the day is your day. Come now. If you need a church home, we want you to come now as well. If you know you need a church, you know you need to get collect, connected so you can grow and use your gifts and talents and be part of a larger body, we encourage you now to come now as well. And then I'm going to call a different kind of altar call. But we don't want to... There's someone that needs Christ, come. There's someone that needs to join this church, come. You don't have to... You can join anytime, but we encourage you to join now at this moment. Now... I'm not sure if we can all fit down at the altar. But I'm going to ask us to come to the altar and spread out as far as we can. If you want to stay where you're seated, that's fine as well. But we're going to do a public commitment of our own faith today and a public rededication of our own, of this church today. sure when that letter reached the church of Ephesus they were excited to hear the very first part but then when they read through the letter and got to the second part I'm sure there were some that were resistant and saying I don't need to change or I don't need to do anything we don't want to be like that we want to be able to hear the commendation as well as the criticism First, this is about you and your own relationship with the Lord. And second, this is about us and the church. So, Lord, individually, we come to you, Lord, asking for forgiveness, for drifting as far as we've drifted from the things that we used to do. Lord, remind us, Lord, of the things we used to do. Remind us of the faith that we have, the joy that we have, the zeal that we had, the things that we did at the beginning. Remind us of the attitudes and the, the way we were, Lord. Just like when we first fell in love with, with someone that we, we love in the world, how excited we were, how, how willing we were to please them and to do things to impress them. Let us have that same mindset with you. Lord, help us to remember and rekindle the love and get the love back. Yes, we have the work and the programs, but we need the relationship. We need the love back. And so we ask Lord for forgiveness individually. But we also ask Lord for forgiveness in the church. Lord, we pause right now to be recentered in you, to recalibrate. And that means all of us have to take a deep look and say, what do we need to do different? And it's okay to repent, to stop and turn and go back to where we used to be. Oh, Lord, let us not forget how we were on 105 East Pilkening. And remember what it was like over there. And make sure we go back to that even over here at 3300 Broad Rock Boulevard. Oh, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you hear our prayers to you. Lord, so right now, Lord, we say these hands are available. This mouth is available. These feet, these arms, our gifts, our talent, we lay it at the altar today, Lord. Lord, forgive us. Lord, we lay it at the altar today, Lord. We lay any bad attitudes. We lay any, 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 anything that's not of you, any sin. Lord, we lay it at the altar today, right now. We're not looking at our neighbor. We're looking at ourselves right now, Lord. Forgive us. Now, Lord, we thank you, Lord. You said that we have ears to hear. Lord, let us have ears to hear what you want from us today. In Jesus' name. And all the people of God said amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Go in peace. Let's make